organized by ATD and Evolution. My name is Sorin and I will be your MC today. So before we begin, um, let's go to the agenda for today. We will begin with an opening speech and ATD introduction by ATD Solutions Consulting Product Manager, Calvin Hoare. And then we will continue with the presentation by Aaron Tandani, ATD Solution Chief Architect on delivering business values in enterprise architecture using TOGAF 9. And then we will continue with Andrew Ruthwright, Evolution Software Consultant, uh, to talk about using TOGAF to support technology transformation. And before we uh, wrap up, there will be a uh, Q&A session with the audience. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to be able to have you guys here with us on the webinar. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Do let me know if you are able to see my screen. All right, for many of you, you would have noticed that there are many familiar faces here in ATD. Uh, for those who have attended our trainings before, thank you so much for the continued patronizing us. <clears throat> I'd like to share a little bit on ATD. We started off back in 2006, and ever since then, we have been heavily advocating on enterprise architecture, uh, not just a normal enterprise architecture, but also doing it digitally. And what stands out the most is that we are actually, <clears throat> we are actually doing it uh, as a culture, not just as a project engagement. And over the years, we are proud to be able to have all these brands under us, such as ISA, Open Group, as well as ISACA, and also Exodus Groups. All right, moving forward, this is some of our clients that have engaged us. Uh, if you have noticed, <clears throat> something worth to mention is that all these uh, partners over here, they are all endorsed by Gartner for their deliverables. And they have also moved on to winning all these EA awards in 2018 and 2019. And I would also very much like to stress that uh, in 2020 for Mampu and PND, they have been listed as the top 10 finalists for the Forrester Award. Uh, I would like to share a little bit on our ATD learning. All right, as mentioned, we are the APEC chapter for ISA. And ISA is an association, it's not when the base is an independent body. And up to current, we have more than 30,000 members. And what is ISA all about? It's all about the enterprise architecture skill sets being supported by the five pillars, such as the design, the human dynamics, as well as the business technology strategy. Something that we could not very much ignore in the current present time, where business strategy needs to be supported by technology. And I think this, I will not need to do much introduction, the open group framework, all right? Just to highlight in 2019, there were more than 87,800 people being certified in TOGAF and it is continuing to increase at a tremendous pace. And for us in Malaysia in particular, we are proud to say that we are the only accredited center for this TOGAF certification. Uh, I guess everyone knows what is TOGAF. It's of course, it's the, uh, all about the ATM, the reference model, and the architectural capability. But what I would really love to stress here is how we can utilize ISA as well as the TOGAF framework for the open group. <clears throat> as everyone is aware, the TOGAF is actually all on the, about the ATM. And for ISA, we're actually talking about the five pillars that are supporting the architecture skills. So how does it actually complement each other? Here, I have done a mapping. It's a very simple one. For example, on your phase A of your TOGAF, everyone will have to be able to have the architecture vision. But how is ISA actually supporting it? It's actually through the business technology skills as well as the human dynamics. And moving on forward, you can see how each of the pillars under ISA are able to support your TOGAF. And I think this is very much worth of a highlight for us to know, even though for today, we are actually particularly talking about TOGAF. And uh, this is some of the high, I would say, the pathway that we have created, be it for to support on the organization's transformation, or it will be for progress in their career. And uh, do, do get, get in touch with us so that we can share more on this, right? Moving on, I would like to introduce a little bit on our consulting as well as coaching services. Uh, over here, I would like to thank uh, Evolution for giving us the privilege to be a partners in the APEC chapter. And I would also like to stress that for the Gartner <clears throat> Magic Quadrant, Evolution has been recognized as the leader 
in the 2020 uh, magic quadrant, right? Uh, since we are at this uh, tool part, I will touch a little bit on the values of the tool and how is it able to support the organization in terms of enterprise architecture. Uh, most of the time for these projects, they are mostly, most of these are deliverables are actually, I would say they are dead documentations. They are not, they are static, they are not live. But with this enterprise architecture tool in place, you are able to actually capture much more than that. And you are able to also do impact analysis and much, much more other things, which I think uh, Evolution will be able to share further later. All right. So for ATD, we are here to create business innovations with digital enterprise architecture. So what these are some of the merits of services that we are able to provide to you. And it's not limited to this. We are always open for customization. Okay, uh, we have actually broken down it, broken it down into a few phases. One of it, it happens with the discovery phases. So for those of you who are not aware or maybe perhaps you have the, <coughs> the direction to start enterprise architecture, but you are not aware of how to do it or where to start, we are here to help you. One of it is uh, we are able to help you with EA discovery and visioning. So here we are able to help you with uh, coaching style, be it coaching, or we are able to help you to do it. And then we are also able to help you with uh, defining your baseline, which is actually very much a blueprint. And from there onwards, we are also able to help you to build your roadmap for continuous improvement. And if all this doesn't work, you would like to know where do you need to start first? We are also able to help you with uh, <coughs> EA readiness assessment, where we are able to see whether your entire organization is ready to embark on enterprise architecture. And this is only the discovery phase. Moving on, we also have our deployment phase where this is, we will dive deeper in, such as helping you to set up on your digital EA framework and also for your configuration of your tools. As mentioned earlier, for any enterprise architecture, if you do not have the tool in place, uh, it's possible, but it will be a very big challenge. So here's where we are also heavily advocating on having an enterprise architecture tool. And also for those who say that, hey, look, I'm trying to start enterprise architecture but I do not get the buy-in from my stakeholders or my higher management. Don't worry, we are here to help. We are also able to help you with this, uh, I would say a lot of change management. We are able to help you with the awareness sessions and things like that, all right? And of course for us, uh, as mentioned, we always believe that enterprise architecture should be a culture thing. It should not be project basis. So here is where we are able to help you to sustain it, where uh, a lot of organizations have continued to engage us on a maturity assessment basis. They would like to do a health check, a yearly health check to see where are they currently standing and how much more they are able to progress and where they will wish to go in the near future for one year or two year plan. And of course, if you embark with us with a tool, we are also able to provide you with the support and maintenance, All right? So that is a brief introduction on ATD solution. Uh, we have had uh, our presence in the Hong Kong, Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, as well as Indonesia. I have left my contact down here. So do feel free to get in touch if you need any advice or anything at all. All right. And I will end my presentation here and I will pass it on back to Fury. Thank you so much, Calvin. Now, uh, let's welcome uh, our uh, ATD Solution Chief Architect, Aaron Tandani, to present on delivering business values in enterprise architecture using TOGAF9. Over to you, Aaron. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Hurin. And I think, um, hope you have a brief introduction about who we are. So let me just focus on the topics of today. Okay. So Again, good afternoon for those uh, who just uh, joined and uh, yeah, the series of our webinar. So this afternoon, I'm going to share about the business value of TOGAF because uh, TOGAF is, you know, I, I have met a lot of the students and also the enterprises who have tried uh, TOGAF successfully and they're happy. And those who are not successful in their learning and understanding of the TOGAF, they said, mm, TOGAF is boring. And basically is that, uh, let me just uh, get the so-called air clear here, because I think I have been myself uh, teaching uh, TOGAF since uh, 2011, so almost 10 years. And so far I have not come across any of uh, my student or our student that said that mm, TOGAF has been wasting my time, but they found it is very, very useful because of the practicality on, on the application of TOGAF itself. 
So I I think now nowadays, uh, if you ask many successful uh, enterprises who have done uh, software enterprise architecture to drive digital transformation, uh, I would say 99.99% they will adopt Togaf. Okay, so I used use the word just now. I I have prefix adopt Togaf. So you need to adopt a uh, Togaf. You need to understand that after that you need to adapt uh, Togaf into your business environment. So basically, in this afternoon topic, I'm going to share with you on the how can you deliver value of uh, adopting the framework uh, like Togaf for your organization. So, so I will be uh, touching very, very briefly. I think just now Kevin also has already uh, mentioned um, about uh, Togaf standard. So I will just uh, again touching a little bit so that we can get the same uh, understanding. Then I will also share with you a couple of terminology that are used in the business architecture. Okay, the reason that I don't cover the entire terminology in the other domain like uh, application, information, infrastructure, technology, solutioning, because I think that one is all we align into the business. So the value delivery will be at that information, application, and the infrastructure or technology. But you want to review the value of EA, you have, you have to reveal it at the business architecture level, right? That I'm going to share. Then there will be a technique of the modeling how we can do that. So uh, we have the business modeling, business capability, value stream, business scenario, and information mapping. Then after that, I will wrap up into the summary. So this just to wrap up on the, when we talk about enterprise architecture domain, there are only, only four domains. So far, the domain has not been reduced to three or to five, it's only four, okay? So the first is called business architecture at the top. So business architecture basically is the domain where you try to understand where you try to so-called to discover on the business opportunity or business concern or business challenges and how the architecture can address that. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing first at the top level. Then from there, once you understand the so-called the challenges that business is trying to address, then you map it with your application architecture. What application that I need to change in terms of the architecture? Do I need to re-architect my application? As well as do I need to uh, re-architect my data? so that my business uh, concern can be addressed. Then the bottom part, you need to establish the technology or what I call it infrastructure. Whether you want to move it to the cloud, whether you want to go to the virtualization, uh, you know, whether uh, you want to go uh, hybrid and etc. So this where all the application data and technology to support the business. Okay, So this is in terms of the architecture domain. Then in terms of the standard, so basically Togaf, they have uh, what they call it uh, architecture development method. So likelihood when you search go, uh, Togaf and you search the image, you will see these uh, uh, wheels. I'm going to explain this in the next slide. Then the next one is content framework. So content framework, I would say is like a database, a meta model for the enterprise, right? So basically there will be uh, like in the strategy, what I what the thing you capture in the business process, what are the other thing you capture in the application uh, collaboration, what other thing you capture? So all that defined in the content framework. So content framework, and another word is uh, the layman term is the database for the enterprise. So far, nobody has this database defined because the database defined typically in the respective department, whereby every department knows what they do, but they don't know other other department. And likewise, they also not intend to share with other department because to them is that. It is my department intellectual property, right? Even you're working in the same company, but you likelihood to share because they got the political tension among the team. So that's why content framework coming in to break through the wall of the politics. Uh, that's the second one. The third one is capability framework where you need to understand about the team uh, competency and the capability that you have. This is about basically about people development, about improving your governance, your process, and etc. That's why just now Kevin mentioned about the uh, ITABO, the ISA. They've got a skill set, a training that for you to wrap up your, your team. Then the next one on the guideline and techniques. So this way, whereby you adopt the enterprise architecture across multiple teams. Like, you know, you don't do have the EA team don't do the EA project once at a time. They might be doing uh, hundreds, or not hundreds, maybe 10, 20 of the parallel EA project. It's the same thing like the IT department. Today, you have multiple projects. It's normal. Uh, with the multiple project manager. The same thing, eventually your architect grow. So this is where the guideline and techniques helping us, how we manage and uh, consolidate and merge and so-called uh, split the job between various architect teams. Then enter enterprise continuum is where you have the continuity. That's why you need to have a single source of truth. That's where the uh, the tools like evolution playing a critical role here. Because you need to maintain, you need to preserve your uh, uh, information and you need also to be able to 
uh, analyze using a technology, using a digital platform. This enterprise continuum playing a role. So these are the so-called the five uh, TOGAF standards. And in terms of the input and output, so typically is that uh, you'd be surprised and many of, uh, actually many people that, oh, architecture, enterprise architecture should be very, very technical. I should call my the engineer or principal engineer that work for 20 years in my organization to talk to you. I said, no, 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 no. Enterprise architecture is about business. You see here, the input and output, if you see on the left, what is the input of enterprise architecture? Business vision and driver, right? How many of us now working in IT understand the business vision and driver and able to uh, translate, analyze, and after that relate to the technology that we are doing? So if you don't, it's the time to buckle up because now is the era of digital. Everyone need to know about the business more than the technology because why? You don't know any technology, you just Google it. They got Wikipedia, they got, they got so many uh, free webinar, the vendor uh, marketing uh, uh, video. You can just understand that in the, just a couple of minutes. I wouldn't say about days. But to understand business vision and drivers, you may, you may take days or months or years. So this is something that we need to be focused at when we are doing now the digital transformation. So business vision driver is very, very important as an input. We need to understand that. Then you see on the right-hand side, the output. What's, what's the output of the enterprise architecture? It's the capability. It's the business capability. Of course, it's realized through deployment of the system and et cetera, but, but this is where we measure our success. This is where we show the value of architecture. We, we develop or deliver new business capability because capability will win you over COVID. Capability will sustain the business. Capability will make us a winner, right? It's not. It's not that. Oh, I got two hundred project. Uh, all the project are going to be deployed this year to another them. So what? You're going to create another two hundred island to my organization. So you better use the word a uh, uh, so-called a uh, sexier words, right? Business capability because business capability is delivering value. Okay. So now let's zoom into the topic in the middle part. So how do we develop that? First. We need to get our capability ready. That's why Togaf called architecture capability framework. So here I'm talking about people competency and also governance in place and the structure of enterprise architecture office need to be ready first. Next, you need to customize and adopt the development method. Just now the circle with, I'm going to share with you the next slide about how you can adapt uh, so-called architecture, the architecture development method for your uh, consistency and also to guide the team to uh, speak and so-called uh, the behavioral into the same level. Then from there, you need to do guideline, guideline and technique. So how many team that you're going to work together this time around and who do what and how you merge, okay? That's called guideline and technique. Then after that, we define on the content framework. So basically now we decide on the deliverable artifacts. What artifact we are going to deliver in each of the phases or in each of the domain. It's called our content framework. Then after that, we set up, we configured our repository. So our repository in terms of any uh, reference material, any of the meta model configuration, etc. all there. So how do we start operating now? First, on the left-hand side, top there, we, the business tell us, these are so-called the capability that are required to address the vision and the driver. And of course, the architecture, we ensure that we can achieve that. Then if you look again at the left side, I... Uh, click now so they got the business need or in fit into the method so basically is that they capture again more on the business inside yeah you see here i have didn't mention about uh, the input on the tcp ip or, or or java or .NET or virtualization that one is later on so we understand the business fit and then after that we confirm that we can deliver that with our architecture uh, capability at the present time then after that the 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 basically informing the business of the current set. So we understand we can do that. So on the right hand side is where we are going to do solutioning, right? So first we need to set the target KPI and also the next maturity level. I think just now Kevin mentioned about the maturity. So it's very, very important. We need to know our level of maturity because we want to grow as we go along in our digital transformation. Then the next one is where we deliver new business solution. Of course, here we are talking about delivering IT project. Okay, so if you see now at this stage, what we do today in the, our era of transformation, we skip many of the process and we just go straight into delivering a business solution, doing IT project. So how do we understand about the all this architecture? Oh, we do it inside the project. So if you do that, basically it's like you are driving a car and in the highway, you're trying to service your car. You are trying to open the, 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 the bonnet of your engine uh, of your car. So what happened? Many 
incident, many accidents. That's why now the project is not a surprise. Even until today, I come across to many organizations, the project delay, the project is requirement creep, etc. Because yes, the thing that is should be done before the, the development, before the solutioning, but you do it inside the solutioning. Okay, so this is the danger of the current practice out there in the industry. And of course, with that, you can you can do a look back to make sure that uh, you have uh, feedback and any changes to the entire uh, so-called uh, enterprise architecture development itself. So in, in to summarize on the architecture development method, so they have the word called ABB and SBB. So ABB, just now, if you see my uh, diagram in the earlier slide, is on the left-hand side, basically architecture building block, right? So what happened in the architecture building block? So before that, of course, they got the preliminary where we need to establish the governance, we need to get management buy-in, we need to establish principle, and we also need to prepare entire organization for the digital transformation. So in architecture building block, first thing first, of course, we need to understand the vision and the strategy. How can we uh, achieve that? How can the technology or architecture team take over the so-called responsibility to implement the vision and the strategy of the organization? That is a real because if you see uh, on the Toga, uh, sorry, on the Gartner, on the Gartner predict in 2019, that Gartner predicted that enterprise architecture team is actually acting as the management consultancy to the organization. Then after that, of course, uh, last year, uh, Gartner also mentioned that um, enterprise architecture make an, an organization to be intelligent, right? You call it now, of course, smart client, smartphone, smart enterprise. So it's the role of EA. And of course, this year, Gartner also made a prediction that um, EA allow organization to decompose, right? Because now we are talking about working from home and how can we decompose all the department, etc. So if you don't have EA, then of course it's struggling. But if you have EA, that is the role of uh, our role this year, according to Gartner. So when we understand the so-called enterprise vision and strategy, then we understand the gap of our current business. So what, what are the things that we need to change? Okay, so with that, we can identify value. Now I'm talking about value, right? Then after that, the same thing. Then we can also identify the gap in the data, right? In the application as well as in the infrastructure. What are the things that we want to change? All is driven by the enterprise vision and the strategy and understanding the gap of the business. Then in the solutioning part, this is where we are doing at the bottom there, consolidating all the gaps that we have discovered. And we turn that into a project. So the project that we are going to do normal IT project. Then, of course, in the phase F, where we approve the project and we develop the gun chart, the project plan, resources, and the budget. Then in the G, we are executing the governance and project implementation. So if the project eight months, in the phase G, it will be eight months, right? But interestingly, you see in the A, B, C, D, E, F, typically is that uh, done inside the G. When you implement, you, you plan the whole thing. But in here, because the world is complex, we better understand what we are going into. Right, because I have come across many the detail that tell me Aaron not to worry. Today is Thursday. We start next week Monday, so let's worry Monday. Monday we start. So this week let's don't talk about the scoop first. Uh, don't talk about the detail requirement. We haven't started the project. Actually, it's wrong. When you want to start the project, you need to have all the detail upfront. It's like you build a construction of the building. Before you start construction, you get all the blueprint of the building nice and and complete. Huh? Then after that, of course, when there is any changes that we need to do. So in terms of the business model, right now we want to show the value. We are doing this in the stock or in the phase A and B, where we adopt, we adapt the model, right? We understand about how we can uh, understand or discover value. Okay, so first we need to get the insight of the stakeholders. That's very, very important. We need to know who is who in the in the our context of the transformation. Typically, this who is who are people with the management power. Okay, we need to understand their concern. Concern means what make them cannot sleep at night. We need to know that. We are not a doctor to give them a sleeping pill, but we are telling them that rest assured that our EA team, our architecture team, we address your concern. Let me come up with a solution, right? That's why we need we need to have the phase B to understand the business. What are the things that we need to change? Then after that, of course, we need to also understand the business goal, driver, and concern of the organization. This is very, very important, right? You can see here that this is pretty much on the business playing field. Nothing yet talking about technology in the ANB. And this is first thing first, when you want to be successful in your digital transformation journey. But today, in contrast, in many digital transformation journey that I have met or I've 
spoken to, they're just talking about all the, you know, all the sexiest the technology, uh, talk about robotic, about uh, IR 4.0, about virtualization, about cloud, cybersecurity, but what's the business case? Not sure, right? So no, we need to put back uh, into the so-called, uh, the right way. So we need to focus on the business first. So in here, where we identify new capabilities or enhance existing capability, that's very, very important. Then we also need to formulate our architecture and the principle of the business. Then we also we need to know uh, value project value proposition meanings. If we don't do this, what is the opportunity cost? So if we do this, if we do this, what are the problem that we are trying to solve? Then of course we also need to know the baseline and the target. Baseline means where are we now, right? If you ask, we tell the senior management that we need to change, change from where to where. So the from is called the baseline. The target is where we are going to 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 move. Which is basically is a transformation. So transformation basically is moving from a uh, current state to a better state. So this is the uh, architecture is always uh, playing in this uh, so-called uh, migration, right? That's why they call it, if you see the TOGAF, it's all about the wheels, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. It's the wheel moving, that we are moving to a better place as we go uh, as we go by. So the next one in the phase C, where we ap apply the uh, business uh, model, to, for us to, to come up with our application data and technology architecture. So basically, without the business model that we have done, there's no way we can come up application data or technology architecture. This is in contrast with uh, many of us think, oh, architecture is the, you know, uh, we, I only handle application, Aaron, I only handle data and uh, uh, technology. You want to ask the business, you ask the other department. <laughs> Hello, you carry the title of architects, you are holding a responsibility to execute the IT budget and you are playing a role in the digital transformation, we need to understand the business. Okay, that is the strong message. And of course, in the phase E and F, where we do a, so, a solutioning and project planning, we also refer back to the phase B, to the business. So what actually we're trying to do? What are so-called the gap that we're trying to do in the business? Because we need to really focus on the business value, the sweet spot on the why uh, today uh, so-called capability, uh, digital capability is so important. Okay, then of course, how we can also uh, achieve or realize the strategy because the strategy was created and strategy typically is the KPI of our senior management. So our job is to help them to achieve and realize that strategy. Isn't it great if we can do that, right? We, we definitely hold a much more power and much more uh, so-called respected uh, position in the organization rather than a typical IT, IT person that is just asking the budget for another project, another project. And you know, people label us as the cost center, but we need to turn it into the profit center. We want to help the business. We want to deliver value using a technology for the business. So let me just briefly uh, it touch base. Just, it's just an introduction about the TOGAF standard. So I hope you can get the gist of the why TOGAF is uh, key and uh, can help us to uh, execute the transformation successfully. So key terminology, business architecture basically is about anything about business from the capability, organization structure, information, uh, roles, responsibility, function, product, policy, services, stakeholders, etc. Okay, so this is about business architecture that we need to know. The capability is actually, actually the ability that the business may possess or action to achieve a specific purpose. Right. So your capability uh, basically is all about your offering, your business offering, and we need to get better and better. A business scenario basically is a technique for us uh, to help to identify and understand and document the business needs. Okay, so basically it's about the technique and how we can capture and understand the key stakeholders. How do we interview the key stakeholders? And uh, this is where we can use the business scenario technique. I'll share with you more in the next couple of slides. So the next one on the business modeling, let me just uh, give you the definition. So business model basically describes the rationale for how an organization create, deliver, and capture value. This is interesting, isn't it? We need to know this because in everyone, it basically, if you don't, if you are not in this so called the business model uh, value chain, our department, I can guarantee, will be defunct or will be terminated or will be ended or will be merged to other department. Because why? Management, she said, this department, no value. I don't see them doing a value despite they got 30 people uh, in the whole department. Unless you can show this, your department will be string and will be basically uh, decommission, basically no more the department, basically you lose the job, right? So our job, we need to ensure that we need, we need to know how to, to develop a business model. 
that's very very important because we need to show the value right then the next one of course the business model is can be abstract or in more detail so let me just share with you on that so the impact and the benefit of, benefit of business model basically is that uh, uh, for business and IT leaders to have both common understanding and of course with the business model we can accelerate strategic execution and alignment that's very very important and of course improve communication with the common vocabulary because the model itself will tell us these are the things that we need to have this information means something and provide a common perspective perspective structure and understanding and of course at, uh, model artifacts uh, highlight critical relationship between the element of the business this is very very important because we want to know the dependency and also the impact uh, analysis should uh, one changes impact other department or other entity in the business and of course one of the example is the business model canvas yeah so business model canvas basically is the one piece uh, representation that uh, that you can show about your organization, right? So this business model canvas, of course, very popular now in the startup, but I think it goes beyond just startup in every department. So every department, if you want to show value, if uh, you need to have, you need to model the business model canvas of your department, okay? Let me just show it you. So this example on the particular uh, uh, business model for the retailer, right? The current state. So basically, we understand about the key partners, right? So the key partners could also be your internal department and key activities, actually, what you do. And then key resources, basically, what are the resources that you are using? Then after that, got value proposition. Basically, why? Uh, what is the competitive advantage of your department of or your business, right? Then after that, of course, your customer relationship and also the channel. How do you uh, provide uh, distribution, right? Maybe you are uh, delivering via a third party or et cetera. Then customer segment, what are your target audience, right? And then your cost structure, as well as your, your revenue stream. So if you can model like this for the baseline current state, then you can use the enterprise architecture uh, concept in TOGAF, then you can uh, so-called define the target, okay? The target means the yellow one is we don't touch, but the one in the brown box is something that we need to improve. After knowing where the organization is heading, so we can do some sort of uh, so-called uh, heat mapping like this. Yeah, to show the changes and of course you can you need to document all this in detail then the next one of course on the business capability right so basically uh, just now i described on the ability capacity of the business to exchange for a specific purpose right so basically business capability describe what a business does this is also very very important right every department if you're working in an it department or even you're doing you're working in the help desk in the software development you need to have your capability well defined because this this is where you need to show the value. Okay, so basically, we need to understand about uh, what uh, need to be done for by the business to support their overall mission. So you have you contribute to the success of the of your organization. That's called business capability. So this is an example on the typical uh, ABC company. So they 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 have so called the structure in terms of the operation, sales, finance, human resource, and all that are supported by the capability at the next level. You can, of course, sim uh, synonymously compare with the function or with the department, right? But capability is basically more on the ability itself, right? Of course, you can map for a start, you can map it from your org structure, then from there, you can break it down into more focus on the capability itself. So this is the example on the capability. Uh, just now, uh, we, we draw from the previous uh, org structure. We can define it into the strategic capability, core and supporting capability. So supporting capability means uh, use uh, across the board, right? Core means uh, by particular department, and then strategic capability means something that uh, uh, give us a revenue, give us a profit, give us the so-called the value, more on the strategic side, like business planning, cap capital management, partner management, and etc. Okay, and we can also uh, leveling uh, our capability. Yeah, for for instance, in this human resource management, we can do a level one. Right, then we can go to level two on the all the capability and also can go to level three. Right. So typically you don't want to go beyond level three. It's not that it cannot, but I think you want to focus uh not going into the granularity of uh of a business artifact itself. So normally you stay at the level one and two, and if necessary, if you need more detail, you go to level three. Yeah. 
So business capability can also use a heat mapping, basically to show about where are our capability. Maybe you can uh, tell that capability of last year, two years ago, this year, and next year, what's your target? So you can use uh, some sort of like a uh, traffic light, right? Like the green mean, mean the desired level, your target. Yellow mean less than a desired level, and red mean less than less than a desired level, two down, and purple mean non-existent. I mean, we really need this capability for us to achieve a success in our transformation or move up into the next uh, maturity level. So this example, if we apply uh, just now the heat mapping to the, our uh, business capability, so this way we can have the so-called uh, our strategy, our core, our supporting in terms of the level. So this way, uh, architect playing a critical role. And of course, when you have something that uh, so-called uh, not sufficient, that's where the the, the the architecture kicks in. That's where the development of architecture in terms of the business, data, application, and technology will help us to understand why are we not sufficient in our capability? Because we need to achieve next level of capability. The next one is value stream. Okay, so basic basically value stream is the end-to-end -end collection that I can result a positive results to a stakeholders. So the stakeholders could be your uh your senior management could be your partner, could be your customer, could also be your end user, uh, the other department. Yeah. So of course, value stream they have the name, description, stakeholder, and value. And typically, is the level of uh, it's like a flow chart, right, from left to right. But in every uh, stream itself, it must show the value, like acquire product, right? Why people want to acquire acquire product? So you must show the value. How you distribute to store? What is the value? What is a stock shelf? So you need to define all the value. Then after that, you map it into all the capability that to make it happen. Because without that capability, the value chain will not exist. So we need to develop this capability, like you know, customer support at the right hand side there. Eh? So at the end of the day, if we, uh, our customer support is weak, we need to uh, so called form or uh, strengthen our customer support capability. Right, because by by uh, putting uh, by by having a customer uh, support, customer service uh, department with the trained personnel, as well as we need to have a so-called uh, uh, system to support that, and of course all the uh, cross uh, capability uh, uh, capability that across different uh, two or more fairly slim, right? That we need to uh, look into this so that we uh, our business can flow. Because the retail value stream is where our business uh, required. And the bottom part capability is, if you see here, all require a technology. This is our role as an architect. And now, we can also uh, map it again with the traffic light, whether we have a full capability, somehow lacking capability, and weak capability with the red. And we are looking, of course, focusing on the yellow and the red one. How can an architect help them to turn it into green? Okay. So the next one is talk about scenario. Basically, it's about uh, addressing the real business problem. And of course, we also want to understand the value chain. And we also want to know the, uh, how can we achieve a desired outcome. And of course, all the business scenario itself is one of the techniques that we can use to capture the stakeholder concern or to understand uh, in depth more of the business. And of course, uh, the scenario itself cannot be fake, must be uh, specific, uh, measurable, actionable, uh, realistic, and the time bound. I mean, we know exactly when we can achieve that. So in the TOGAF, typically the business scenario we use a lot in the phase A, where we understand the architecture vision, where we talk with a lot of the key stakeholders. It typically is uh, going through the interview or a, a so-called a visioning workshop. Then in the phase B, where we understand with the various uh, business stakeholders to understand about the so-called the structure, about, of course, all the challenges, the concerns that they have. And in the requirement management, business scenario used to identify document requirement of architecture. And this way, requirement management also is uh, captured in the digital repository. Then in terms of the information mapping, basically it's about how the information flow across uh, products, across uh, processes, across the function, across the department, or across uh, internally, be it externally to the client, or perhaps to your merchant, if you're doing an online store, the information also need to be sent to the merchant for the amount of the invoice and the bank detail. Okay, so basically something like this: if you are on the on the loan, the bank, 
right? How uh, the information uh, being transferred. So this is something also uh, very, very important that we need to know about this model. Of course, when we talk about this model, this model can be configured uh, uh, live inside the digital repository. And I think uh, shortly the, uh, uh, the evolution we can show about how the tool works, right? So basically it's not a PowerPoint like mine, but it's more on the live and that you can analyze the data itself. Okay, so this is another example on the typical uh, uh, information flow between the stakeholders, uh, business capability, product, and yeah, basically anything that you can see that what information required to be transferred across a uh, department, across stakeholders, uh, from customer and across a distribution channel. Okay, so information map, map is basically used a lot in the phase A and B where we want to understand the so-called relationship about the various key stakeholders and also about the business uh, department itself. Then, of course, in the phase C, D, and E, where we are using a lot of information system to define our database structure and also our application as well as our hosting, right? In terms of the encryption, what data need to be sent, whether it's confidential, etc. So a lot of them are being used in the phase C and D in the technical part. And in phase E, where we uh, update the so-called uh, information map itself. Okay. So in summary, every architect, if you are not the business architect, if you are data architect, application architect, technology architect, or solution architect, or infrastructure architect, there's a one word that one sentence that I must say. You must master the business architecture. So, meaning you need to perform the role as a business architect as your secondary role. You cannot say, "Oh, sorry, Aaron, I am a data architect. Uh, I only work with data. I don't know about business strategy." And then, 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 don't call yourself as the architect. Don't call yourself as a data architect. Don't call yourself as the application architect. Don't call yourself as a software architect. Don't call yourself as technology architect if you don't know anything about business, because this is a prerequisite. For any architect to be successful, you need to master, you need to understand, you need to uh, uh, comprehend the business architecture. And of course, you need to be able to talk with the stakeholders. We don't talk to CPIP with the business stakeholders. We are talking human language. We are talking a business language, uh, lingo. And of course, of course, mastering the business architecture is what separate architect from the rest of the IT profession. Because the rest of IT profession, if you are in the title senior principal software engineer or senior principal network engineer or senior principal data scientist, be it there, you don't need to know business architecture. You will survive. But if you want to call yourself as an architect, you need to master business architecture. And this separates us from the rest of other IT profession out there. right? Because this way, we show the value of technology. And of course, technology value are discovered and shown to the stakeholders through the business architecture engagement. We cannot share with them our network diagram. We cannot share with them our data flow diagram to show the value. We need to show the business architecture artifacts engagement, right? This is the key. And of course, this is the real uh, 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 sentence. Was out, mastering this skill set, you'll be promoted quickly. And I have seen this Myself, in the last uh, 10 years that I've been uh, teaching a lot of courses, many of my students actually, when I have, actually this, this sentence is in the couple of our training. And after that, I met them again in the seminar, etc. And then they told me, Aaron, when you told me, I re remember in your class, you told me that mastering this skill set, you'll be promoted quickly. I'm in that stage. But they said, now I don't have time for my family. I don't have time for a weekend. I don't have time for holiday. So I said, well, what do you want in life? I thought a uh, few years back, you complain. You you miss the promotion, you cannot achieve more in your life, why your, your colleague get promoted and why they go into the senior management. Now you're already there. So I said, why, why, why are you complaining? Right? If you complain, then you go back to your, to your junior level. So as we go along and then you know people want to achieve more. So these are the secret that the one you, you listen to my talk uh, about half an hour or more, these are the secret for any IT professional to be successful. Okay. So I think with that, I will just uh, hand over to Hurin. I think uh, this is what uh, Kevin has described about what we do. So we conduct training, coaching, consulting, and also we implement a lot of the uh, successful uh, digital transformation with EA. All right, I hand over the time to Hurin. Thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you for that uh, insightful sharing. Uh, next, let's welcome our next. Uh, speaker, uh, Ovulation Software Consultant, uh, Mr. Andrew Thwaite, to talk about using TOGAF to support technology transformation. Andrew? 
Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen. Um, I also have my colleague Liam Ryan on the call as well, who'll be doing just a couple of these introduction slides. So I will hand over to Liam Ryan for these first couple of slides as well. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to Aaron and Calvin, as well as Hirin as well. So uh, as uh, Andrew mentioned, my name is Liam Ryan. I'm the Growth and Marketing Manager for Evolution based in Singapore. And just want to give you a bit of background information, of course, about Evolution and our EA Tool Abacus before uh, we jump into Andrew's main presentation today. So as a bit of background information, uh, Abacus has been a tool that has been leading enterprise architecture for close to 20 years now. We've uh, been in the industry for, for 19 years, coming up to 20 years at the end of this year. And we've grown from being uh, an organization which was a spin-off from the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, as many software tools are generally um, spun off from universities. But we're now a fully private company and we have over seven offices worldwide. So those include, of course, uh, Sydney, Australia, Singapore, where I'm calling in from today, uh, London, where Andrew is calling in from, as well as Dubai, uh, uh, the United States, uh, as well as South America. So we have quite a, a good distribution across the globe. Uh, as Calvin mentioned earlier in his slides, we are a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, and we've also been lucky enough and uh, have uh, been honored with the Forrester Wave leader position as well for quite a few years now. We do have clients, of course, spanning over 100 different countries, um, and we have worked with clients um, or worked with over 3,000 different companies as well uh, to, to date. So we have uh, a good spread across multiple industries as well, uh, not only, of course, in banking and government, which are two of our largest sectors, but across a multitude, including technology, um, as well as infrastructure, uh, gov uh, government, as I mentioned, and uh, quite a few others as well, which are probably in subsectors too. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to Andrew and we'll kick off the rest of the presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Liam. Um, so yes, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Andrew Luthwaite. Um, I work as a consultant for Avolution. So um, taking part in, of course, webinars like this, um, helping our customers um, deploy Abacus, which is the tool that we produce. Um, and of course, in this case now, I'm going to go through some slides um, to talk about, I guess, digital transformation in line with TOGAF. Um, giving some examples, but towards the end of the slides, I'll also just give you a sneak preview of a demo of Abacus as well. Um, so that should hopefully give you some ideas of the slides that Aaron presented and how we can actually utilize some of that knowledge um, within the tool. The first place I want to start though is how does transformation actually affect you? Um, and this can vary um, from whether you are a consumer of information or if you are a business um, facing. And typically, if we pick on a, a specific industry, something like fintech, um, in the last couple of years or the last five years or so, um, there have been a number of startups that have happened within the financial industry. Now, in one way, this was a, a large transformation, a large digital transformation shift. These companies that you'll see on the screen here um, were typically startup banks. Um, they had no ATMs, they had no branches, they had no physical cards at the beginning. It was a simply an app on your phone that you could then actually consume banking capabilities and more recent times, including things like loans and mortgages that they've moved into. So there's been really a big shift here from how traditional financial organizations might work and the speed at which these organizations can pop up. And these are actually all over the world as well. There's a couple here in Europe and the UK. And these are across the US and Asia as well. But certainly from a fintech perspective, this has been where digital transformation has affected people and organizations. And I don't think, you know, when we talk about things like this, we should see it as a bad thing. It's, it's challenging the industry to make sure that they are also adapting and changing to effectively what Aaron's been saying at the start, what are the business needs? What are the customer needs? And how do we actually adapt around that? Now, there are consequences to this, and there are consequences to digital transformation, um, including when we had things like dating apps pop up, um, certainly parts of um, the restaurant industry um, certainly noticed the impact on them there because no longer were they hosting these types of events. Um, you also have the impact on things like news outlets 
Um, again, Aaron mentioned you can Google anything these days, so you can get any type of information at your fingertips. So traditional news outlets, magazines, newspapers have also seen that decline as well. There's also a consideration to be made on the actual consumer or the customer side. So those fintech companies that started up, um, the ability to process a loan, the ability to simply, on some other companies, delay payments for things that you purchase, has that knock-on effect from the customer side. Um, and there was a stat that was released a few years ago around the four times increase of people ending up in debt via these types of apps and via this technology transformation that has made things easier, but so much easier that you fall into these traps. There's also industries such as um, the photography industry and certainly some of the companies that would um, hail themselves as being the, the best photographers, let's say, and now in everyone's smartphone, you probably have a, a professional grade camera um, that you could actually utilize. These are all technology transformations that have happened and are continuously happening as well. <clears throat> we can take a larger example here. So one of the, the biggest industries actually undergoing um, digital transformation or certainly a shift in transformations is the car industry or the automotive industry. Now, when we really think about this, one of the first things that we think of is, oh yes, of course, automatic cars. That's exactly the digital transformation that's happening. Um, and that's exactly what's happening across a lot of the global companies and the bigger companies like Apple and Google. Although the automatic cars part is arguably the least shift in digital transformation. The biggest shift really is in the platform that these cars have become. So cars now are on the cutting edge, car manufacturers or companies like Google are on the cutting edge of things like camera technology, semiconductors, neural networks. All of these are platforms that are then used within these cars. So not always should we be seeing the immediate technology transformation that's happening, i.e. a shift from maybe manual to automated cars. We're actually seeing the shift of the technology behind that. We'll come back to some of the technology aspects later on. Um, but the first thing to maybe quickly, quickly clarify is the industries that we work in or the industries that you work in will all go through some kind of digital transformation. We effectively are <clears throat> working in this digital economy. So whether it's agriculture for sensors in farms and agriculture, whether it's the transport industry, which probably has taken a bit of a hit these last few years, um, but certainly they're needing to now shift um, forward to make sure that they survive. Retail industries, manufacturing, technology industries themselves have to shift because not only were technology industries maybe well known for producing semiconductors, now they have to compete with people like car manufacturers. So there's a whole area where these digital transformations occur. And that's really just how this affects, um, in theory, everyone um, that's potentially on this call. So digital transformation, I guess, was what we might classify as an eventuality, um, and now it's actually just become a necessity. A key part of this transformation is the strategy versus execution argument. Um, and there's a few statistics that we've pulled together here around and um, what people see as the best plan. So should you build uh, a very um, impressive strategy up front? or should you start executing as soon as possible? The more studies you read, the more you might find that execution is actually the key here. Um, but more interestingly, I think, is that a lot of senior executives feel relatively comfortable that their organizations are actually prepared for this shift. If you speak to some of the IT personnel, a third of those believe that their senior executives would be concerned if they had a better understanding of their department. And that's a key misunderstanding or misalignment there between what the business thinks it wants to do and what currently is needed to be done or what technology maybe exists. So typically, maybe strategy used to win over execution, but the speed at which things change these days, execution becomes much more important. Now, of course, it is always important to have a plan and we'll discuss how that might look. 
Um, but you clearly can see that both are needed. But if you do have that best plan and you have no way of executing it, then of course, you're not going to get anything out of that. So again, you're just trying to make sure that you can adapt quickly to these types of changes and both are needed. So why aren't some customers or some consumers ready for this? Well, a lot of the time there's a lack of commitment, resources, or in this case, maybe technology that's maybe stalling or blocking some of the transformations that are trying to go ahead. One of the ways that we can actually help to be ready for this is to actually understand the vision. What does the company actually want to achieve? How do we actually um, effectively allocate those types of resources? How do we become more efficient to make sure that what we do have in place executes that vision? And arguably more important is use the right tech at the right time. Um, technology is always going to be seen as something that most organizations want to adopt when newer technologies come on board. Whether that's things like RPA, microservices, those types of areas are, I would say, important to understand, um, but should be treaded lightly in the sense that which technology you use is important. Okay. And that's evident from some examples here. So you shouldn't just adopt the technology just because it exists. So technology, as I said, should be an enabler for these types of transformation. Um, you should understand what is the business need, what is the business value of these technologies and understand how they can be best placed. Um, there's a couple of examples here. Um, I'll focus on one of them, which is Juicero. Um, this is an organization um, a couple of years ago now um, and they sold a juicing machine. So they would have this machine that you could have in your kitchen. They would sell subscriptions to these juice packages that you could um, buy and, and put into the machine and it then extract the juice from those packets. Um, this machine was about $400 or so. And the subscription was there. It was connected, so it was Wi-Fi enabled. Um, it could read the barcodes on the juice machines and the juice packages that you put in to see if they'd expired. At the time, this was new technology that was quickly adopted by the organization to try and sell. Now, what customers quickly found was that $400 machine wasn't needed. You could buy the juice packages at a very low price. You could squeeze these by hand and that simply would not need the machine. It probably doesn't come as a surprise that putting technology first like that made that company soon fail. Um, so it went from what might have seen as an innovative product at the time, there was a lot of hype around this type of system and that very quickly um, went out of business. So that's an important lesson to learn. The technology might exist, but if it's not applicable, if it's not necessary, if it's not needed for that type of business outcome, then it shouldn't be used. There's a number of different examples in here as well. Um, we've done similar WebExes around um, specific examples here. Um, so feel free to look through those at your own time as well. So what are we going to actually get out of this session today? Well, I want to quickly go over what we classify as the five steps for transformation. Once we go through these, I can start showing you how this might look in Abacus as well. We also say transformation, but maybe more specifically, we should actually be thinking about the execution here. And a lot of the steps or stages that I will talk about are things that Aaron has already mentioned as the TOGAF ADM. So we are defining the vision, we're auditing our current situation, determining some kind of maturity. So in this case, maybe a digital maturity. We have to be able to measure things to be able to adjust those. And then we want to make sure that we are able to communicate this to the wider business. So if we start with defining a vision, one of the key things is actually understanding who needs to be involved with this vision. And one of the key areas there again is understanding what the business does. So the classic idea of walking the floor, speaking to departments, finding out what the business is doing, that's gonna be one of the key things to build a specific business vision. Um, and this isn't just a, a general business vision. It could be the vision for specific projects or programs that you're working on. What you're really trying to understand is who's involved, who's using what maybe applications or technologies internally, what processes do we have, what capabilities do we have 
and that will then align to the vision that we're actually building. Defining the vision has actually become quite a key thing across our customer sites as well. Um, you need to be able to have this type of information to understand where you're going. So you need to be able to have a vision so that in the future, when you do try to execute that vision, you understand if you've achieved that or if the areas that still need to be improved on. A key thing that Abacus can help with here is actually trying to integrate this into a single platform. And so we really want to make sure that when we try to define this vision, we're trying to find out all of this information. It's this identification phase that's first. So do we want to maybe bring in all the information that we have from other services that we're using? So importing content from CMDBs, from SharePoint, and maybe manually importing some of this information if needed. But we're just trying to build an idea of what we look like. Identifying each of those areas is also important. So when I mention around building the vision, we also at the same time will be building our current situation. So again, centralizing this information and making sure that it's all accessible to users. Defining the current vision um, is also an important aspect of the frameworks that we use. So TOGAF, of course, being the core one that we're going to be discussing. Um, but it's important to know that TOGAF is a methodology. It's a framework that can be utilized alongside other types of notations and methodologies as well. So certainly if we want to build detailed process diagrams, we might use something like BPMN. We might want to include reference models. We might already have drawings that people have produced in Visio documents that we want to use. The key aspect for the current situation is making sure that there's a shared understanding of all of the content that we have. So we don't really want to be maintaining things manually too much. We want to automate as much of that as possible. Another key area for the current situation is making sure that there's some kind of focus here. So we shouldn't be too broad, let's say, or too vague in the way we capture this information. And there's no real need to import all of the content in every CMDB you have just for Abacus to then just become another CMDB that you have to maintain. So you do need to make sure there's a focus here on the current situation. What is it that we're trying to achieve? What's the vision? How do we get that information into a centralized repository? And then how do we actually use that information going forward? So that's one of the most important aspects of trying to define that current situation. The next step is digital maturity. So digital maturity can span across a number of different areas. So whether it's around the capabilities that we have and the maturity of those, um, the digital maturity of our strategy is also important, of course, and we want to know if we do have the right technology in place. But technology as a, as a, a vertical in here can also contain its own sections. So to adjust and measure the maturity, we might want to be thinking about, well, what does our security look like? Do we have the right security protocols in place? Do we have the right controls in place? From a digital channels perspective, do we support customers across our um, websites, across emails, across phones, across apps? Do we have the right support team in place? Can we actually analyze all of the information that's coming in? There's a number of different resources that you can actually use to understand digital maturity. Um, and that's certainly an area that we can help with and um, HD can help with in terms of understanding, are you in the right position potentially to adapt and change and build some of these projects and understand which areas should be worked on going forward. So capturing that current state, defining the vision, having some kind of focus, and again, having some kind of self-awareness of the maturity internally. So that makes sure that we can actually use and execute those types of projects successfully. Now, again, one of the key phrases I guess you'll always hear is if you can't um, measure it, you can't um, adjust it in our case. Um, and one of the ideas here is that if you collect this information, you want to again understand what type of metrics or KPIs are we capturing. So if, for example, we are capturing information about our applications, we might want to know what data is being passed. How critical is that application to the organization? What kind of strategic recommendation are we making? If we were modeling our processes, we might be more concerned with how 
and often they run. Are they reliable? Are they using systems that maybe aren't secure? Are they accessing data they shouldn't? Are they being performed by multiple departments? This again allows us to adjust our plans going forward. It's very rare that when you define that vision that it doesn't change over time. And I guess it's important that it does because the more information you find out, the more you're capturing the information and analyzing that information, the more you're likely to adjust to make sure that you hit the business needs at the end and maybe don't just blindly follow a plan knowing that it's probably not going to be successful. A key way maybe of actually capturing some of this as well, which you can see on the screen here, is trying to embed this elsewhere. Um, so for example, you might want to start using Abacus across other platforms that you're already using, so Confluence and Teams, um, where people are already working. You want to make sure that they have the ability of updating and creating pieces of work within those platforms and allowing Abacus to just consume that when necessary. That's a key step for keeping things up to date and current as well. It's about getting other people involved in this data collection. This tends to lead into specific use cases. So for example, if we know who owns or uses the application, then we might want to know which ones are at risk of a cybersecurity attack perhaps, which ones are up for a rationalization. More these days, which ones are gonna be useful for a cloud migration project? So again, measuring this information is key. Now, when we do come to measure that type of metrics or KPI-based approach, one of the ways, of course, is capturing those headline properties or KPIs, as I mentioned. So criticality, recommendation values, lifecycle dates, all very important. More important is utilizing some of the powers of no code within Abacus. And that's the ability of actually performing formula-based or algorithmic-based approaches for calculating the information. So if we have a list of you know, a thousand applications we've managed, they're connected to multiple capabilities they're supporting, and those capabilities are delivering on the business's um, vision or values. We might want to run some of these algorithms to understand, well, how complex is that system? How well, maybe from a business or a technical perspective, does that solution fit in to the project plan? And so we can be quite um, deterministic about these by building algorithms that allows us to calculate these types of values. And this can range across any domain. So the reliability of the infrastructure, the availability of the services we have, the openness of the capability model, the financial metrics, of course, being relatively important in terms of which solution is best suited for us. And that comes down to what we do in comparing scenarios. So Aaron mentioned earlier on, we have this idea of a baseline and a target situation. Um, and that's exactly what we'll likely model in Abacus. So the baseline being the current state, and then maybe we have multiple target scenarios. So maybe multiple project options. Some are decommissioning apps, some are introducing new ones. Maybe in this case, there are new integrations or interfaces behind the scenes. We can actually model those and use that metrics-based approach to perform a trade-off scenario. So when we do have multiple projects that we're choosing from, are we going to choose that project that is low risk, low cost, and maybe not as efficient as another? Do we choose the project that gives us quicker time to market, but is much more complex and much more difficult to maintain over time? As you go through this trade-off scenario, where you try to understand which option do we choose? So this is one of the most important areas of effectively Abacus and what our customers would actually do. Now, if we actually think about these different scenarios, um, we can come up with a, another example here, which is quite an interesting one. Um, Domino's Pizza was an example we used last time, and I think it's relevant again here because Domino's Pizza um, is an organization, of course, that produces pizza. Um, but what they have become is not just a, um, let's say, a restaurant business as such, but a technology company. And what they went through was effectively exactly the same situation as this, which is a trade-off scenario of the various options that they had to move forward as a digital technology company. 
they introduced personalization across their options. Consumers could choose exactly what type of pizza that they wanted. They were the first pizza delivery company to use drones. That was clearly a good trade-off scenario for certain situations, probably more so due to COVID for delivering those types of pizzas would have been a good timing. Um, but certainly that was them pushing the envelope of what they could achieve. They also used AI software internally as a different project. They could actually analyze each pizza that was made and realize if it was good enough and grade those deliveries and pizzas based on that quality. They introduced pizza tracking apps. They have become effectively an e-commerce company that happens to just sell pizza. Now, the key story there is there are a number of different situations that they went through in trade-off scenarios, some successful, maybe some not. But the idea is that transformation project is ongoing. When one transformation happens, another is waiting right behind. And it's very likely that these are happening at the same time. As Ara mentioned, you maybe have 10, 20 of these projects or programs or situations or scenarios happening. So it's important to adjust that and likely hitting the market at the right time with the right solution. The final step, is actually communicating this information. So when it comes to understanding the business vision, capturing the current state, understanding the metrics that we have and how mature we are across these different domains, all of that is fine, but we also need to make sure that we have the ability of allowing anyone in the organization to consume that information. Aaron mentioned earlier on, one of the key areas from the TOGOF perspective there was the inputs being things like the business values and the business vision. What does the business actually do? And there's no way of knowing that unless we're actually communicating this information across the organization. So people want to be able to access the information. They want to know, well, what list of applications are you holding in here? And what processes are you saying they use? If I can see that, I can tell you that I don't use that application, I use this one suddenly uncovering a lot of shadow IT that no one really knew about except for that one person. You often have to be careful about the context that you communicate this in. So the context is key here for the stakeholder. You want to make sure that there's enough depth for certain users and enough coverage for others. You don't want to give all of the information to everyone. You want to make sure that the information that you have and the information that you're giving out to the organization is credible and you're building a real trust in that EA function. You also need to make sure that you're telling a compelling story. Um, there's no need to just post a dashboard with you know, 50 different KPIs and metrics if there's no story behind what you're trying to communicate. You need to make sure that you're using some real examples, providing some options for people to look at and making sure that you can actually visualize those clearly. And empathy, of course, is understandable as well. You might think that your audience knows what you're talking about, but maybe at times they don't. So you should also make sure that everyone in the organization is involved with any project that's going on. It affects them in some way, whether it's decommissioning of systems, introducing new capabilities, opening up new digital channels or new markets. Most of that content needs to be communicated and most of it needs to be communicated in a really effective way. Now, there's a number of um, screenshots that we have in here for showing these types of dashboards, um, but we're on a live webinar, so it probably only makes sense that we show you some of this live in Abacus at the same time. So what we have here is an Abacus Enterprise dashboard. This is one of the ways that you can actually communicate the information that you've built up in the model. And the way this works is that we can effectively build dashboards for different users and different stakeholders. So for example, we might have some users who work in the risk department. So we might only give them access to some of the risk dashboards that we've produced. Now, of course, at the beginning, one of the key areas would be defining the vision. Whether it's the business or the IT vision, they should eventually be aligned in terms of what they're producing. And one arguably may drive the other, but again, by communicating what each department is trying to do, what are the goals we're trying to achieve? What objectives are we trying to hit? What projects and capabilities are we utilizing to reach those types of goals? 
giving people an idea of the vision of the company and the vision of the projects and programs you're working on will only increase the credibility in the outputs that you then deliver at the end. If we took a very specific view from a technology perspective, I mentioned earlier on, technology shouldn't be the driver here. It should be technology supporting the business. What is important though, is when you capture this information, you should be able to use it effectively. You shouldn't need to be um, scouring through hundreds of Visio documents and, and PowerPoint slides and Excel sheets trying to figure out what's happening. You should start utilizing these types of views. So for example, we have a list of the web servers that we have internally. So we have an IAS web server and Apache Tomcat server, some of the technologies that we're using internally. Now, as a user, I might want to know more about this IIS server. Well, what does that actually mean? What's it connected to internally? Okay, so there's a number of applications that require this technology. It's supplied by Microsoft. It's also used on a couple of these servers that we have. So this is information that maybe I wasn't aware of, and maybe we can see that the IIS web server is something that should be decommissioned. Maybe Microsoft is stopping supporting this technology. From this view, if IIS was no longer supported by Microsoft and therefore internally we need to shift, we need to make sure that we make changes to this application. But of course, the organization isn't that simple. This CRM application is connected to a number of different databases, services that we're producing, projects that we're working on, interfaces to other applications and departments that use this application. So by communicating this information, not only are we looking at the direct impact of change in one area of the organization, we're seeing the indirect impact elsewhere. And this is the idea that everything on a single platform is connected to each other. So by utilizing something like a graph database in Abacus, we can actually leverage the ability of seeing all of this information throughout the company. During COVID times, this has been especially useful um, certainly for us internally as well, but a lot of customers are hiring, of course, at the same time as trying to build up their model. And when you do have new employees coming on board, one of the first things they might be interested in is knowing more information about the projects that they'll be working on, the services that they'll be introducing, the capabilities or processes that they're developing. And by allowing them to have this as a self-service at their fingertips, make sure that they have a clear understanding of what's going on internally. It also gives them an opportunity to make those changes. So again, by using Abacus Enterprise, we shouldn't only be visualizing this information, we should be maintaining, we should be updating this information, we should be adding new content to this information. So it's all about communicating and making sure that people have a platform where they can actually model these different situations. Now, communicating those situations is important as well. One of the views that you might want to do that is focused on cost. And um, cost is always a big driver, so it's always a good topic to, uh, to start on, really. And um, of course, there are other KPIs, as I mentioned, reducing complexity and um, increasing efficiency internally. But cost is always a big driver as well. And what you can see here on the right hand side are the different projects that we have going on. So we might understand our current TCO, our current cost for our architectures or the current state. And then we might want to know, well, what if we do go through an IVR upgrade project? What does the cost look like after that? What does the cost look like after an application rationalization project? Clearly after a digital first initiative, those costs increase. So we can start using this to communicate these different solutions we're building so that users can understand the options that are available to them. If needed, they can deep dive into these areas. Why is the cost increasing? Are we introducing new systems? Are there new capabilities or processes we're redesigning? This is part of why we try to centralize all of that content. The other key message here really is in the style of the visualizations. And I don't want to go into this too much, but TOGAF is gonna to be a key element of how you might use Abacus. And of course, it's a supported framework. You might be, of course, utilizing the full meta model in TOGAF or parts of this model. And again, seamlessly, you might be building different dashboards for different areas of those phases in TOGAF as well. But one of the key messages here is regardless of the framework, 
or the methodology or the notation, you want to be able to communicate things well. If you use something like Archimate to draw detailed interface diagrams, there's a lot of notation involved, you understand it as an architect, don't assume that the CIO that you're showing that information to also understands that Archimate diagram. You're using that as a model to build up an output. You've built a solution in Archimate and your output should be the value of that solution, not the solution itself. So make sure that when you build these types of dashboards, that you are communicating that information effectively and building on that as you go through. One final thing to mention, bringing this again back to the TOGAF um, methodology in here, is how does it actually relate? I mean, we could take um, a very simple phase or phase A in here, the first one, um, and we can already see how that aligns to some of the key steps that we've identified so far. Defining the vision. TOGAF should be used as a toolbox. It should be used to build some of the models that you're wanting to analyze and understand. Using TOGAF as a toolbox, picking out the areas that you need to use, that's going to mean you can actually execute the projects or solutions much more effectively. Also, at this stage, it's probably worth finishing on one of the key things that TOGAF mentions during one of these phases for the technology phase. And this is something that's evident across all of the content we've been through today, and both myself and Aaron. And that principle within phase D is that only in response to business needs are changes to technology made. So it should never be the other way around. Never introduce technology like Juicero or some of the technologies that NASA have introduced. You should always be making sure that you introduce technologies to business needs. 